Uh, hey everyone, my name is Mike. I'm giving the, the last talk for today, um, the last talk for the school, I guess, uh, about um, what, I, what I call different perspectives on content generation. Um, so uh, if, if you don't know who I am, I'm an AI researcher. I work at Queen Mary University of London currently. Um, and I do things like uh, build AI that work in creative domains, like designing video games, for instance. Um, lately, I've been really interested in building tools that help people work with generative systems. Uh, and we're going to see a little bit of that later in the talk uh, about how we can make generative systems easier to control. Um, and I also am really interested in finding ways that, that procedural content generation can create new kinds of video games. Um, and this talk was originally going to focus very much on this third one, um, but I didn't want it to become like a pure game design talk. So uh, in the end, I, I've kind of split the talk into two different kinds of areas, which I hope will be a nice balance for the end of the day or the start of the day, I guess, depending on where you're viewing this from. But uh, it's five o'clock here in Denmark, so everyone's a bit lower uh, energy. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to talk to me at any point after, after the summer school is over, um, if you want advice, if you want to show me something cool that you made, anything, um, I'm always available on Twitter or email. Please do get in touch if you have any questions about this talk uh, later on. So um, this talk has kind of two, two big parts. Um, I wanted to show you ideas about generativity and about unpredictability uh, elsewhere in human culture and, and see like, what we can learn from it, what we could bring to, to games and procedural generation with that. Um, and then I kind of wanted to go to, uh, on, a, on a completely different tack um, and give you a bit of a technical chunk as well, where we look at like how we can take control of uh, these generators that we build, how we can overcome some of the things that frustrate us about them. Um, and in general, it was just to, to sort of do a talk that's um, a fairly laid back and just gives you a couple of nice things to think about um, to maybe influence the last few days of your project or to, to change your thinking going into the future. So. We're probably doing this the wrong way around, but I'm going to do the technical stuff second and start with the, uh, the nice discussion stuff. Um, so watch as my caffeine crash hits me. So um, the, in the abstract of this talk, I mentioned that um, procedural content generation for games is, is kind of stagnating. And, and I'm, it's not true you know, universally. I'm sure you've got your favorite examples, uh, favorite counter examples. Um, and all of the people that you've seen speak this week are all fantastic people in the field of PCG research and development, uh, game development. And they're all doing amazing stuff. But um, in many ways, we are kind of still stuck in, in the 80s still a little bit. Uh, if you look at the, the top 15 games on Steam that have the procedural generation tag, uh, most of them generate uh, sort of levels um, and usually not much else. Uh, now, for some games, obviously, for No Man's Sky, it generates extremely complex levels. There's a lot going on there. Um, but uh, for, for many others, it's kind of like a shuffling a deck of cards kind of approach. Um, and for many games, that is absolutely perfect. It's exactly what they need. And later on, I'm going to tell you that Spelunky is the best procedural generator ever made for that reason. Um, but in general, we, we kind of keep returning to this idea that I call more unpredictable stuff. Um, and that's like what most of these procedural generators do. That's the function that they have. So when Borderlands 3 was announced earlier this year, one of the sound bites, one of the like, talking points in the trailer was over 1 billion guns. And the only thing that matters there is that there's one billion of them, and that's it, uh, pretty much. So we're always interested in more. We're always interested in, um, we really only care that it's unpredictable. Like We only really care that the next gun is not something that we know in advance. Um, and it's sort of like stuff. It's often like content that doesn't really have any relation to anything else that's going on in the game. It's kind of interchangeable. Now, this approach is perfectly fine. Uh, there's many games that use it well. Um, and it actually has many benefits. Um, so for one thing, you can have a really low quality ratio. You can have a very uh, a low ratio of um, like good and interesting pieces of content to, to kind of bad and throwaway ones um, because the content is extremely low impact. Like if you, if you think about playing Diablo and an uh, enemy drops a piece of, drops an item, it, it doesn't matter to you if that is a bad item or an uninteresting one or one that you've seen a hundred times before because after a while, your mind just starts filtering it out. Um, and actually, as a result, like by emphasizing that, um, it actually makes it more exciting when you find something that is interesting or that does change the game. And this is actually you know, an aesthetic that some of these games kind of go hard on and, and make you feel, it, like it makes that kind of that experience more exciting. Um, these kinds of generators are also slightly easier to implement. We don't need to worry too much about filtering, too much about quality control, this kind of thing. 
which makes them feel less risky, which is especially important if you're like pitching uh, this to you know, a larger company or people who aren't familiar with it. And it also makes it easier for us as designers to add our own design sensibilities and our own ideas into this, um, into this system. So for instance, this is something which Spelunky is very famous for. It really encompasses and models Derek Yu's ideas about level design, which is really cool. Um, and above all else, as we mentioned about Borderlands, it's, it's easy to sell to people. So if you imagine that you've made this procedural generator and it's perfect, then everything it makes is unique and interesting. It's still actually very hard to demonstrate this to people. You could like show them a few examples, but that still wouldn't convey it because they could be cherry picked. Um, we don't actually have a very good vocabulary for selling or advertising or promoting a procedural generator to someone. The only really way we know how to do it that we've tried and tested is just to tell people how big is it? How many things does it have in it? Um, and so it's, it's simple, like marketing is hard and this makes it simpler. Um, but there's loads of drawbacks. Uh, in, and the major one is that we encourage people to treat procedural content generators as um, just hoses out of which content spews, and that content does not matter. You don't have to think about it for more than five seconds. Uh, this Spelunky level you're playing, it'll be gone in 30 seconds, um, and you'll never see it again, and it does not matter. This item that just dropped out of this monster, you could just walk past it if you want. It, its name isn't even blue. You don't even need to read the name. Like, it's, it's white, you can just walk past it. Um, and this has knock-on effects. So we start to feel that procedural content is kind of mass-produced and all of the negative associations with that word. Um, and after a while, you get people who just kind of automatically associate um, procedural content generation with the absence of human creativity. So um, I had this bizarre exchange on Twitter recently with someone when I was talking about coming to give this talk at this school. Um, this journalist, uh, I think, thought I was talking about like Twitter bots that advertise things. They thought that, that was what we were gonna do or something like that, I'm, I'm not really sure. But, but in their mind, this was just, this was like something for um, you know, programmers with no knowledge of art or creativity or anything in their bodies. Um, and that was the only people who did procedural generation. Um, and it, it can also blinker us over time, even us as creators. Like I, I find it hard to think outside of these restrictions sometimes because everything I see and play and, and experience is doing the same kinds of stuff. So, it's good every now and again to kind of look outside and, and draw inspiration from somewhere else. So what I thought I'd do is talk to you a bit about um, ways that generative systems or things which are like generative systems have influenced humans um, in other areas of life. And most of the time when we're talking about that kind of thing, we're talking about unpredictability. Um, and this is like the, the core of a lot of generative stuff and uh, a lot of generative experiences, and it's the core to a lot of other human experiences going back thousands of years, so things like rolling dice. Um, and these have extremely deep roots in our history. So people used to believe that when you rolled dice, the outcome was dictated by the gods. Um, there was no such thing as chance, and so if you wanted to decide something, you could roll dice and say, you know, commit, like bet on the outcome or commit to the outcome, and um, literally the gods would, would decide what number the dice showed and, and that would uh, affect your future. Um, and we can see this also through things like divination. So um, there's lots of ways of fortune telling and telling the future which use unpredictable sources as their kind of uh, the root of all their information. Um, and this is coming back from the idea that like gods or, or universal forces were responsible for these things. Um, so there's a thing called claromancy, which is the kind of this general term for divining through randomness. Um, and the example I've got here is, um, so, you know, it's very common, lots of uh, religious people will often like open the page of the Bible or the Quran to a random page. Um, the, uh, on the Iranian New Year, and also like other nights throughout the year, but particularly New Year, Iranians will open uh, this book of poetry called the Divan of Hafez. Uh, Hafez is like this very famous Iranian poet. And they'll read the poem that they open the book to, and they'll look at the little explanation, and that will like tell them something about the year ahead. Um, and you know, that's not entirely random, like you're very unlikely to turn to page four of a book, you're more likely to turn something in the middle, but like it's, it's unpredictable enough, like it's, it's decided by some other fate. Um, and that gives people something to think about, something to dwell on for the future. And of course this naturally brings us to tarot as well, which is another very famous kind of uh, divination. And this one is actually directly derived from a game. So, can see how games and, and unpredictability are already intermingling. 
Um, if you're not familiar with tarot, it's very similar to a deck of playing cards, but you also have these extra cards like the Empress up here. Um, and each of these cards represents something. So the, the major arcana represent quite big concepts like change. Um, and then you have like smaller cards that might represent something more specific or a variation on a theme like um, supporting friends through difficult times. Um, and often like a card will have several different meanings and, and cover several different areas. Um, and the way tarot cards work is you, you shuffle them and you can pull them out and, and uh, intuit things with them. But the, most, the way that they're most commonly used is something called a spread. So a spread is like a recipe for answering a question or getting guidance for something. So um, for instance, you might have a spread where you lay down 12 cards in a circle and each card represents a month of the year ahead for you. Um, and so when you turn over these cards, the, the job of the reader is to relate the possible interpretations of that card to something specific in your life. Um, so in all of these cases, in like divination through opening a book or drawing out cards, um, what we're essentially doing is, is providing people with a focal point um, that they did not come up with, and in fact, no one else came up with. Um, in tarot, you can argue it's kind of like, uh, like intermediated somewhat by the, um, uh, by the reader. But uh, in general, what this is doing is it's like breaking a deadlock for people and offering them something to focus on. So it doesn't matter whether you believe that tarot cards can literally predict the future or not, that's completely irrelevant. The point is that when you sit down and you, and you pull a tarot card out to answer a question, it makes you think about one aspect of that question or that problem. And often people with, with big problems like this need that. They don't know what to focus on. They're too anxious. They have decision paralysis. And that's why these things are can be very helpful and they can be very um, useful for people. And we see this in games and, and creative contexts as well because generative systems can often prompt us, they can inspire us to do things in situations where we would otherwise not know what to do maybe. So Minecraft would be a much worse con creative construction game if its worlds were all flat green plains. Um, it's when you walk and you see a valley and you think about bridging across the two sides of it or you see a waterfall and you want to hide something behind it. Those are those moments where the generative system is giving you a prompt. It's giving you a suggestion that you can, that you can riff off of or, or respond to. So this is, uh, this is solving the, the fear of the blank canvas, uh, kind of. Um, we can also see unpredictability everywhere in creative endeavors as well. So um, earlier in this week, you had a talk by Kate Compton about casual creators. Um, so I won't go into massive amounts of detail about what they are. But um, one thing which I imagine Kate brought up, I haven't had a chance to watch her talk yet, is that these tools often have um, systemic, often generative systems within them that smooth over things that the player does and kind of, kind of take off the rough edges. Um, and that has, that has two advantages. One is that it, it can kind of spur people on and give them momentum because something unexpected happens and then they respond to that and it becomes like a dialogue. Um, but also it relieves pressure as well. So in Spore, it is not possible to build a creature that does not move. Um, and some people want to take that to its extreme by like removing all of the creature's legs. Um, and so it's also kind of like, a, you know, no matter how stupid you are, we will, we will respond to it. Um, but it's also like, you don't have to worry about putting the legs on wrong. There is no way to do anything wrong here. And there are intelligent systems, AI powered systems that are there to ensure that nothing ever feels wrong in this game, which is super important. And in a similar case, there are lots of like older examples of games which have properties like this. So a very um, popular game is called Exquisite Corpse. Uh, most people don't know, like that has lots of names and most people just don't have names for it. Um, I, I never did until I had to look it up for talks like this. Um, but this is the game where you draw like the top of a body um, and then you fold it over and you give it to someone else. They draw the middle part, you fold it over, someone else draws the legs. Um, and here, there is like no expectation that the outcome will be normal. In fact, it's not possible. Like, it's sort of against the, the premise of the game. And so the unpredictable nature of what other people are going to do is what makes this um, an interesting creative task. And so the way I, I put this is that what these systems are doing, what this unpredictability is doing, is adding noise to this creative process. And this noise both um, muddies the field of like, did you do this properly? Because there's no longer a properly because the generative system is kind of getting in the way anyway, even if you were trying to do something perfectly. Um, so this is a game called Drawful, where you are given prompts that are bizarre. Like one of these phrases on the screen was the prompt that was given. Um, and then 
obviously whatever you draw is going to look weird and other people are going to describe it weirdly. And so the outcome is hilarious because the prompt was so unpredictable and people's responses to the prompt are so unpredictable that um, there is, there's no way to, like, to accurately draw a magic janitor if that was the prompt. Um, and so like, like Exquisite Corpse, unpredictability here helps diffuse a tense uh, creative situation. Um, and the other cool thing they can do is offer someone to blame. So Google has this nice uh, system where you can draw something and their AI will like continue the drawing and you can sort of uh, like uh, uh, co-create co something, I guess. Um, and the great thing there is that you get to blame Google's AI if it goes wrong. Like you don't have control over half of this drawing. So again, here we have like a system that is enabling people, like it, it is creating things and its creative act is taking the pressure off the, the player's part of the creative act. And if you're interested in some of these things that I just mentioned now, even if you're not actually, this is a fantastic GDC talk. You should go and watch Holly Gramazio's inviting player creativity through game mechanics. And, and I think it, this actually has a lot of relevance to, um, to generative systems. So Holly is, is talking about like, how do you design games that help people be creative, that make them want to be creative? But in many cases, you can think of generative systems doing, performing similar acts. Um, and so she has this recurring motif of her friend Sarah drawing a window. And first she just says, draw a window. Then she says, draw that window over there. Then she says, uh, draw half of a window and like, I'll give you like a starting point. Um, then she gets like uh, uh, another friend to like, I think draw, they, they take turns drawing a line each and all these different, and it's like peppered with examples of other games that have done this successfully. It's a fantastic talk and, and I think it has a lot of uh, relationship to some of these aesthetics that we've talked about. So staying with the theme of, of creativity and creating, um, a lot of artistic disciplines use unpredictability as well. Uh, although like the way I'm interpreting them now, you might find a little bit weird. Um, but for instance, street photography, where you are walking around a city and you're looking for interesting things to take a photograph of. This is using the unpredictable nature of a city, like in rush hour, you know, constantly evolving, constantly changing. Um, and you are being challenged with finding a photograph in this space somewhere. So this photograph here has, you know, it, it has great use of the different architecture, like the stairs, the stark white wall, the, um, the big glass building behind it that is reflecting another building across the road. But it also has this figure in the middle that is sort of hunched over, looking a bit odd, staring down at a phone or something oblivious to these massive structures. And two minutes later, this photo can't be taken anymore. Someone else has walked into shot. This person has looked up from their phone. They've walked off. Um, so this, this, the photographer is immersed in this, in this essentially like generative system, if you'll uh, stretch me that far. Um, like, and, and this thing is constantly evolving, constantly changing. Its state is constantly being modified. And you can think of it as a generative space of photographs that are constantly, like some photographs are leaving, new ones are entering, and you are exploring the generative space by walking around, looking at things, and figuring out what photo you want to take. So here, there's a completely different relationship with the generative system or the unpredictability. You're actually supposed to explore as much of it as possible. You're walking around, you're trying to consider as many things as possible to find the one that you like. And so we see this discovery problem all the time. And, and we actually see it a lot in simple generative systems um, because as I was saying before, they have a very low quality ratio. And so discovering something good feels exciting. And, and you particularly see this in Twitter bots. So if some of you follow Twitter bots, you'll find that, you know, many of them, some of them just put out like constant hits, like every tweet is gold. Um, but many of them put out like rubbish most of the time. But you're there for like that 1% of the time when it makes an amazing joke and you were there for it and you get to share it with the other people that follow this bot. And maybe you even saw it coming, like you knew it was going to happen eventually. And that moment is something that people share and they enjoy. They enjoy feeling that, that they were being guided through this journey to this massive generative space and this diamond just appeared one day out of nowhere. I, but, but the reason why it's, it's, I would argue, it's slightly less satisfying than the street photography example is because um, discovery as an aesthetic works best when the generator is still active or the content is dynamic in some way. Um, and so that's why street scenes are really exciting because they're always changing. So this was a rubbish photo that I took on the way here today. Um, but even here, if I'd waited 10 seconds longer, the swan would have come over and tried to bite my face off or something. Um, and so I had to pick my moment, you know, and that, that's what made it interesting because I was constantly having to pay attention. 
Um, on the other hand, if we're you know, going through our Twitter feed and we're just sifting through finished pieces of content, it's either good or it isn't. And, and over time, our senses become dulled. And so there's sort of like an awkward uh, example I wanted to give here. But if you imagine looking for somewhere to build a Minecraft world in, it's more pleasing and uh, satisfying to walk through one world and see it slowly evolve and things pull into distance, you know, things pop into the draw distance and you explore around the corner of a mountain than to just hammer new world. If you keep hammering new world and just looking for like three seconds, um, you will eventually get tired of this. It's either yes or no, they're either good or bad. You don't have this curiosity or this exploration. And going all the way through, the most explicit use of you know, generative systems in art is people who use generative systems as art. Um, so uh, Saskia Freak is one of my uh, best, like favorite examples of this. Um, she makes uh, an artwork every single day in processing. Uh, many of them are animated now. The animated ones look incredibly good. Uh, you should definitely go onto Twitter or Tumblr and uh, check them out. Um, and I'm obviously, I don't know exactly how Saskia works, but based on how other people and my experiences using processing, you don't often know, especially when you're doing something so fast that you're making one every day, you don't know what, is, what, what this code is going to output until you run it. So you write a bit of code, then you look at the output, then you go back and change it a little bit because you're defining this generative system in just a few lines of code, but then it gets expanded to this whole image of pixels and colors. And so you're constantly going back and forth and you're trying to understand like, what is this thing doing and how can I control it? Because the controls are not direct. If I was painting, if I was just trying to paint one of these images, I would just you know, pick a couple of colors and draw some geometric lines and I'd be done. But that's not what we're doing here. We're, we're doing something indirect through a layer of abstraction. Um, and if you want to see a gamified version of this, uh, the game Earth Tongue is a really good example. So in Earth Tongue, you are um, essentially looking after a wild garden on an alien planet. And you don't know when you start the game what anything does. You don't know how any of these plants or seeds or animals behave. And you have to understand how this generative system works by poking at it and doing things and testing theories. Um, so this is obviously a little bit different to when you're using it as, a, as an active artist. Um, you're kind of in the lead there. But uh, this is exactly the same kind of aesthetic, but, but gamified. Um, and this process is fundamentally like full of surprise. So if you've ever seen live coders uh, create music, um, actually like uh, writing code live and the code is constantly being recompiled and it's creating audio that people are listening to and usually dancing to, um, often they don't know what's gonna happen. They make a change and they see like, do they like this sound? Is, is it going the way they thought it would? Or maybe it will inspire them to go in a different direction. Um, if you ever get a chance to see a live coder work, it's super exciting. I really recommend you look at it. Um, and you can see here generativity, unpredictability, all of these things affecting the creative process. And in some cases, you're, you know, the user is in the lead. That they, I couldn't think of a good phrase for it, but you know, in live coding and generative art, you are directing, you're, you're going somewhere. Um, but in games, it, it's kind of, you, know, you can also have this other way where the system is mysterious and they're trying to figure it out, kind of like an earth tongue. And another really good example of a game that does this is Panoramical. So um, this is like a, a series of vignettes which, which have uh, a generated audio and visual component. And the player is just given a few buttons that control variables, but you're not told what these do. So you sit there and you see, well, what happens if I change this one? And maybe not much happens, but maybe if another parameter is changed, then the first one has like a huge control and maybe like the floor turns into an ocean or something like that. And this is a, a great example of an accessible confusing, mysterious system that is very pleasant to explore um, and has a completely different way of using generative uh, systems in a creative context. So, you know, maybe you already knew lots of these or, or maybe like one or two examples are new or maybe it was just a different angle. But, but my point is that generative systems can be more than just more unpredictable stuff, um, which is, you know, it's easy to forget that. I, like, I forget it all the time. Um, Generative systems have impacts on people when they are you know, part of a game that they're playing, for instance. They can be confusing, like intentionally, in a good way. They can be immersive. They can direct people towards certain creative goals. They can distract them from their worries and fears. And they can challenge them to do certain things. And so when you're using a procedural generator, it's really important to, to think, like, which parts of the generator do I care about? Which parts do I want people to be affected by? Like, this is not just a thing that, you know, it's not just that I used to make this part of my game by hand, and now I've made an algorithm that can make it for me. 
um, it's different. The, the generator can also be an extra part. It can be like a part that your game couldn't survive without. You know? There is a version of, uh, say, Dead Cells where, <laughs> okay, this is maybe a bad example, but where I, I just handmade like a static castle or like five static castles. But you can argue it's not the same game because the point of that game is that you are adapting to a changing landscape and that you don't know, you're improvising. So even there where you have like a very straightforward um, uh, procedural generator, you still need to think like, what is this doing for me? What is this doing for my design? And one thing that came up when I was talking uh, about this last night with, with Martin and Mass is that um, these aesthetics are very, very delicate. So No Man's Sky is an incredible game and uh, they've done unimaginable amounts of work on it to turn it into something that people really love. But um, in changing the way the game works, some aspects of their original kind of generative vibe um, have been lost. So by having all of these game mechanics that you have to engage with more actively, um, and having the only alternative be a creative mode where you have no real danger to yourself whatsoever, I believe, um, they kind of missed, they kind of like lost some of their original aesthetics of this kind of vaguely threatening but very desolate landscape. Now the landscape is full, like other people can come and roam around it with you and you can build stuff in it. Um, and it's probably a better game for most people, but its aesthetics have changed. So you have to really be careful and watch out because these things can change uh, very, very easily. Before we move on, I just wanted to tell you, just, I just wanted to throw in this one slide and tell you like why, why, why are like all of these things important? Because I know for some people, some people this stuff is like really interesting, and for other people it's like, well, why would I care like what artists are doing? I'm not an artist. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know how you all would describe yourselves on your CVs or your Twitter bios, um, but I would argue that if you signed up to this summer school, one of your interests is generative systems. And the problem with that field is that it doesn't exist. What it is, is it's several like pockets of people who are spread across many different disciplines. And they just, these disciplines just go everywhere. You just, you find people interested in generative systems all like every day in different parts of the world, in different uh, like departments and places like that. And what that means is that not only is it hard for us to meet anyway, because we're all sp spread out, but all of the existing gatekeeping, like all of computing snobbery towards the arts and, and vice versa, like all of this other gatekeeping is also keeping us apart. So it's like extra hard to find out what other people are doing. But they are really your colleagues and your peers. Like in a good world, we would all be in one big department of generative systems working together. And so you should think of it as like, you know, you're doing this for yourself and also for our field that doesn't really exist but should. Um, it's kind of your duty to go out there and find new things and see if they can inspire you or influence you or, or change how you think. And it doesn't mean you have to become a musician or an artist. Um, you can still be a game developer if that's what you want to do, but maybe it will make you a different kind of game developer. You know? So um, do me a favor and like, if there was anything that you hadn't seen before or thought of, like, go and hunt down some more info about it and uh, follow some new people on Twitter, that kind of thing. Follow Saskia if you're not following. So now to go the complete other direction. So I talked to you about all of the things outside uh, PCG and games. And now I want to drill down into something square in the middle of PCG and games. So one of the biggest problems that people have with PCG systems is that they are hard to control. And this um, is the root of lots of misconceptions and like bad feelings towards PCG. Um, this is actually from a GDC talk that was being very positive about procedural generation, but I took it because it has the quote from one of his friends um, talking about that it takes control away from me. You know, I, I don't have control over it. Now, controlling, like uh, designing kind of by feel, as I call it, is, is actually super powerful. Like you don't need control over a generative system. If you uh, listen to the Spelunky Show podcast and you hear Derek Yu describe <laughs> how uh, he made the procedural generator for Spelunky, how he picked values, um, it is essentially he sort of randomly picked some stuff and saw how it felt and then changed them a little bit. Um, which is amazing because it works incredibly well. It's one of the best procedural generators ever. So there is nothing wrong with designing this way at all. Um, but, you know, it can be tiring and it can be frustrating. And some people just want to do things a different way. So I wanted to talk to you about some steps that people can take to change the way that they interact with their procedural generators. So this is a procedural generation loop. Um, and we have our algorithm at the top, which is this thing that does stuff. And for the purposes of this in particular, I want you to imagine that I didn't write this procedural generator. So maybe I'm a technical artist in another department. Some programmer has come over, they've made this thing, and they're giving it to me. 
And all I have are these, these arrows, these inputs and outputs. I have content that comes out of the algorithm, and I have parameters and controls that go into them. Um, and so I want to talk to you about the two sides of, of this loop. Um, and I want to talk to you about it with reference to uh, Don Norman's um, gulfs. So Norman talked about like two, two problems that happen whenever someone has to interact with a, with a machine or a system or anything, really. Um, and the first he called the gulf of evaluation. And so the problem here is um, this system is producing something. The system is doing something. Um, and I need to know what that tells me about the system. So how do I understand the current state of the procedural generator, what it's doing, and how easy is it for me to, to figure that out? So if you're anything like me or any of the other people I, I tend to ask about this kind of thing, the first thing you're going to do is you're just going to run your procedural generator a lot. Um, and we normally do this just in the process of writing code. Like we run, we run our system just to check that it's running OK. Um, and so you're going to generate some levels, and you're going to say, well, you know, th th let's imagine that we've been given this level generator for our platformer. And you think, well, is that OK? I don't know. Um, probably. Like maybe you generate five. Maybe you generate 20. Um, this is you know, a very common, and it can be very effective way of like, spotting quick errors. But we all know as we do this that it has problems. Um, it's extremely fatiguing. You, get, you very quickly become unable to pay attention to new details. Um, and we, we know that you know, if our generator can produce one billion guns, and I've looked at five of them, I know that this is not super representative. And if the error rate is you know, one in 100 or something, it's not going to tell me that these errors exist, for example. So the next step up from this, which um, you know, maybe a handful of people tell me they use sometimes, is to define in code uh, metrics that, that record something about a level. Um, so this now, I don't have to do this by eye anymore. I'm actually saying something that I'm interested in that I can explicitly write down. So in this case, um, I've said that a level is nice if the first power up you get to is before the first enemy that you get to. So this kind of makes sense. Like I should be able to get a mushroom in Mario before I reach an enemy maybe. That makes a level very much easier. And so this is something which I can write in code and I can actually get the system to check. So I can have the generator generate like 500 levels and then tell me what percentage have this property. Um, uh, what percentage of them are nice. And maybe I want that to be 100, maybe I'm okay with 90, maybe, it's, maybe I don't care, I just want to know. Um, and this sampling method is actually really nice. It's very good when you have like small questions that you want to answer very quickly. So this is rogue process, this is a game I'm making, and very, very frequently I just want to know, like I've just added this new um, thing that can appear in levels under certain circumstances, it's not controlled by just one probability. So I need to know what percentage of levels contain this thing. So we generate 1,000 levels, and it tells me you know, 200, 250 of them have it in. And it's super useful, very quick. But for lots of questions, this doesn't tell us everything we want to know. It only tells us a little bit. It, you know, it can answer these kind of yes or no questions, or it can validate certain theories. Um, but in our, in our nice platformer level example, we might want to know, well, OK, how nice are these levels? Like, is the, is the first enemy you know, miles away from the first power up, or are they sitting on top of it? Um, how nice does this get? Like, what, what were the extremes? Um, how bad are the ones that aren't nice? Are, are we talking like you know, the enemy is basically next to the power up, so it's not too difficult? Or are there like 10 enemies, and there's one power up at the very end of the level? So what we want is, is more data, and we also need a better way to visualize it. So on the reading list for this uh, summer school, I put a paper by Gillian Smith and Jim Whitehead about expressive range analysis. It may well have come up in the summer school already because it's, it's a super popular and cool technique. Um, I just have one slide on it, so don't worry. Uh, but the, the idea here is that you have uh, things that you can measure about your generator, and it's best if they're normalizable. So in this case, you can see these magic metrics I've got are normalized between 0 and 1. And then you sample the generator hundreds of times, just like before with our, with our previous nice example. Um, and each time we get a result, we calculate the two things that we're interested in, and we plot them on this histogram here. Um, and we do this hundreds of times. But the important thing is that if the same data point gets plotted more than once, it increases the color intensity uh, on the histogram. And so you end up with something that looks a bit like this. And this is the kind of image that does not often travel very well on streams. Um, but hopefully you can see that in the middle of this blob are like darker white, and then it gets slowly grayer around the edge. And you can also see here that there's kind of a negative correlation here as well, which is also interesting. So whatever these metrics are, it might suggest that they're opposed somehow. 
And maybe these metrics are super obvious. Maybe it's like number of enemies in the level and number of uh, ground tiles in the level. And the enemies have to be on the ground, so you would expect there to be a relationship or something. Um, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's way more subtle. And the nice thing about this is that, you know, here are some examples from Gillian's paper. This is so visual, it, it makes it much easier to assess. So for instance, the, the middle one at the top, you can see there's very dark white, like bright white areas in the middle. Um, in the bottom right, you can see it's kind of squished. So the, the y-axis metric, there's less expression along it. Uh, the top left, I don't know if that's showing through on the stream, but this is like not intense at all. It's kind of spread out across the whole metric space, but it's way, way less intense. And it's just very easy to visually register things this way, as long as you have like metrics that tell you something about the, about the uh, thing. And that also means that if you make a change to your generator, it's really easy to see what this change has done um, according to these metrics. So it doesn't tell you everything. There might be hidden things that you're not seeing. But, but for these metrics, it can very clearly show you um, where there's been a change. So if you're interested in more about this kind of thing, I, I built a tool called Dinesh in Unity that tries to automate some of these processes and add some more AI on top. And we wrote a paper in 2016 about more of this kind of thing. Um, but uh, I, I didn't want to go too deep into ERAs, um, but you can do some pretty pretty interesting stuff with that. Um, so this this illustration here is actually randomizing all of the inputs to the system while it's performing this expressive range analysis. So you see like all of the possible things that this generator could produce, for example. Um, so remember, we were talking here about the gulf of evaluation. So this is like, I have my procedural generator and I want to know what it's doing. Um, this is only half of the interaction problem though. The other half of the problem, is that anime? Yes, okay, um, is on the other side, where the user now wants to take an action. They want to do something. And Norman calls this the gulf of execution. So we already have the gulf of evaluation, which is do I understand what the system does? But now I want to change something about the system. And the question now is, do I have the information I need to plan and take an action that will alter it in some way? And the reason why this is particularly difficult for procedural generators is because our inputs to a system are normally variables like percentage chance to spawn an enemy or um, number of secrets per level or something. They're, they're numbers which control specific features or in the worst case scenario, they're even worse. They are um, very vague mathematical operators that affect some noise function. But the things we're measuring, the things we want, the things like the, the way we talk about levels, like is this level hard enough? Is this level fun? Uh, these things have no bearing uh, to these variables usually. They have no direct relationship. Um, and so it would be nice if there was a way to pull these things a little bit closer together. So what actually is happening? Like when we have a, a metric, for instance, like the chance to spawn an enemy, um, and we have something that we want to measure, like um, how fun a level is, like what is actually going on? How can we measure the, the relationship between these two things? So this is some new work that I've been doing that I'm gonna be presenting later this month, um, and you're the first audience I've tried to explain it to, so uh, apologies. Um, but one thing we can do is something called a smoothness analysis, um, or what we call a smoothness analysis. So what we do is we have this parameter um, that goes from you know, zero to one, or some, some range that we've defined, um, and we take regular samples along the range, maybe like every 10%, and we set the parameter to that value, and then we sample the generator loads and loads and loads, like we were doing an expressive range analysis, and we record the average value uh, for this parameter, the average uh, metric value, say how, well, <laughs> we probably don't have a metric that measures how fun it is, but uh, measures the niceness of the level, for example. Um, so at this parameter value, what is the average niceness of the level? And what we do is we do this a bunch of times for, for a bunch of different parameter values, and we end up with uh, a bunch of points um, that form a line. Now, in an ideal world, um, in the absence of all other information, we would ideally like um, something that controls something to have a linear relationship with the thing it controls, right? So if we were changing a parameter with the intention of changing a metric, or if you were turning a, a dial on your shower with the intention of changing the temperature, we would want there to be a very even relationship. As I turn the dial, we would expect the temperature to rise. But as you know from using showers, this is often not the case. And we, we, you know, we turn the dial a little bit, the temperature goes up a little bit, then we turn it the same amount, the same distance as before, and suddenly the temperature skyrockets or maybe it even drops because pipes are funny and the way valves work is different and this is you know, not a very super uh, uh, new control or something. Um, 
And so controls are unpredictable. So when we do this smoothness analysis, um, what we would like is that you know, at regular parameter intervals, magically, we would love to see regular increases in this metric. But the odds of this are very slim. Um, so this is just the thing I, I previously mentioned, which is, you know, if I, if I increase the parameter by 10% and I see a change, then when I increase it by 10% again, I, would, I, might, you know, I might expect to see the same change. If I've never seen this before, if I've never used this generator before, I probably expect to see the same change again. Um, or at least in, the, in an ideal world, I would like to. But the odds of this actually happening are, are very low because this metric we've defined it has nothing to do with, with the parameters or the inputs or the algorithm. And so what we more often see is something like this. This is a real curve. Well, it's a sketch of a real curve that I drew in Keynote. Um, but this, this is like something which we observed in one of our generators in Dinesh. Um, and here it's, it's pretty obvious what the problem is. If I'm a user and I'm coming along and I've never seen this generator before and I change the generator a little bit, it increases this metric score a bit. And then I think, actually, I kind of wish this was twice as high. So I, I move it a little bit more, and suddenly the value just shoots up. Like, it just skyrockets. And, and I can't tell, like, at what point during that change um, the value I actually wanted was. So for Dinesh, we came up with a solution um, and kind of aimed at, um, it's, it's a little bit early days, but it's actually it's surprisingly effective. Um, and our solution is that we just lie to the user. Um, so the user says, I really wish this parameter controlled this metric. Um, and what we say is, okay, we can fix that. So when the, when the user is changing this parameter value, you know, this chance to spawn enemies, for instance, they think they're in control of this axis. They think they're in control of the parameter. But what we do is we instead interpret their input as um, a control for the metric that they're interested in instead. So instead of changing the value of a parameter, what they're actually doing is telling us what they wish the niceness of this level was, or what they wish this metric was, was uh, evaluating to. And then we take that smoothness analysis that we made previously, and we use it as kind of a reverse lookup. And we say, OK, if we wanted 60% niceness, or 0.6, whatever, what value should the parameter be set at? And if you look at this graph, it would be very hard for the user to actually find the value in that massively steep curve. But for us, it's very easy to calculate if we know um, what, what metric score they're looking for. So then we go back and we, we, use, we, we turn their hidden input, their fake input, into like a real setting for the, for the uh, system. And so what you're looking at here is um, at the top, you're seeing outputs from a cave generator. This is a super ugly procedural generator. And I promise one day I will get a better example for my talks. But please bear with me. Um, and you are seeing the result of um, one of the parameters. It doesn't matter what the parameter is, because the whole point is we, we don't know anything about this generator. Um, but what you're seeing is five samples evenly, like at 5, 25, 50, 75, and 95% of this parameter. And then what we did was we smoothed the parameter according to a metric called density. And density basically just measures how much rock is there in the generator. And then we replaced the parameter with a fake smoothed version of it. Um, and what you can see here is that, um, for instance, at 25%, it looks pretty much the same. Um, but at 50%, you can already see the unsmoothed version is basically not usable. If this was a dungeon in a roguelike, it is already like completely disconnected. It's full of tiny islands. Whereas the smooth version is about 50% dense. And we're just controlling one parameter. So if we smooth a different parameter, we would get a different kind of effect. But um, in this case, this is about 50% dense. And at 75, the unsmooth version is completely unusable, um, whereas the smooth one, OK, it's a little bit disconnected, but you know, it's about, it's, it's about um, what we would expect it to be. And what we've effectively done is we've taken the real smoothness analysis, and we've stretched out the bits that are interesting and compressed the bits that weren't interesting and turned it into this more linear relationship. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, Later this month, and I, and I will put my talk up on YouTube, I normally record them um, around the same time that I give it at the conference, but we've got a paper called General Analytical Techniques for Parameter-Based Procedural Content Generators, because as I get older, my, co my, my colleagues uh, don't like it when I put jokes in my paper titles. Um, but uh, that, actually, that's not true. They're, they're, they're good sports, but I feel bad when I do it. Um, so this paper goes into depth about smoothness, and it also introduces something called codependence, which is like two-dimensional smoothness. And uh, I have literally only included this picture because um, I'm so proud that uh, I made it in LaTeX. And I just want to show everyone. So you can see this 3D uh, graph that I made. 
Um, and this is really cool because you can say, okay, I have this parameter x and I change it. And now suddenly parameter y is behaving differently. Like why is that? And the answer is that they're, they're codependent according to this metric. And you can like visualize that. And in some places it can really reveal amazing relationships that I didn't realize were, you know, were existing between different parts of the, of the generator. Um, so that, I believe that might actually be on my website now. You can actually read um, it. Uh, but in any case, I'll be giving a, a YouTube uh, talk soon. So wrapping up, because uh, it is late, I just have a few more slides. So I don't think procedural content generation is about the algorithms you know. Um, I don't think it is about like what architectures you're using. I don't think any of that is important. And I think when we look at the, the generators that truly move us and stay with us, like Spelunkies or like Panoramicals, what really matters is the people that make them and the understanding they had about the things they were using. The understanding about how um, the user, the player, um, has a relationship with the generator, the generative space, the, the space of possibilities they're moving through. It's about understanding how the unpredictable parts of your system affect the people who interact with them. What kind of emotions is it bringing out? What kinds of, of problems is it making or solving for people? Um, and we can also help us and other people to make these kinds of decisions more happily and better and by building tools that give them different ways of controlling it. So like I said, I don't think every generator needs to be put in a cage and controlled, um, but I think uh, it's, it's another cool way that we can make generators more accessible to more people. So do not despair if the thing you're making this week is all over the place and you don't know how to control it. Um, do not be afraid if uh, you want to do something weird that you think is probably going to break because that's super fun. Um, even though it doesn't feel like it, I think procedural generation, it's still massively early days. Uh, it feels like we've been doing this for decades. Generative artists have been doing this for forever. We saw examples from 3,000 years ago using like dice to generate stories and things like that. Um, but truly, I think we're only just beginning to see the kinds of cool stuff we can do with computers and randomness and things like that. Um, in, in conclusion, procedural content generation is a land of contrasts. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, here are some ways that you can uh, find out more about things that I do. Thanks. <laughs> I, I get applause because I'm doing it in person. And where are all of you, by the way? I came here expecting you know, all of you to fly over. Uh, and, oh, absolutely, like, I'm here, by the way, if there are questions or anything like that. But I know it was, it was kind of an odd talk. There's nothing like specific you might want to question about, but uh, I'm always around if you want to say anything. Um, on the side of a mountain, that sounds pretty good. There aren't many mountains here. Uh, do you know what strategy street photographers use? Yeah, you suggest that they wander as much as possible. Uh, but I wonder if they don't sometimes stand somewhere. Yeah, um, I don't know if I need to read this out for people. I guess I do for YouTube. So, but I wonder if they don't sometimes stand somewhere they think has a high chance of leading to a good picture, sort of finding high quality areas of the search space. So you're absolutely right. Um, some street photographers, so I used to like doing this kind of thing. Um, some street photographers will wander around a lot. Some people will find like part of a photo. So they'll find like a setup that they know will create a good photo if something happens. Um, and then they'll wait for you know, someone to sit on a bench in the right place, or you know, they'll see that someone's food is about to be grabbed by a seagull and they'll wait. Um, but I think, um, so that one way of looking at that is, as you say, they're, they're, kind of, they're kind of finding a high quality area of the space. Another way you can think of it is that they're moving along the space in another dimension. Although, but I guess, I guess we're all moving in time always, so maybe that's redundant. Um, so, but yeah, no, I think, that's, I think that's a good observation, yeah. But there's definitely different strategies. Some people kind of, um, especially, I, I used to do this a lot because I also did it because I wanted to go on a long walk. Um, but some people just kind of walk because they like the feeling of kind of like ramp rapidly pressing regenerate on a, on a procedural generator. So you, sometimes you just want to be overflowed with, with new ideas. Um, uh, underneath, as an academic, I find it hard to get people on board with aesthetic qualities as important. Specifically, they want some way of evaluating aesthetics. Ah, how do you address the issue of evaluating things like aesthetic and PCG? I am probably a terrible person to uh, ask this question because I kind of fudge this by um, pretending that when I'm an AI researcher, I just make stuff like, uh, you know, Angelina and I don't evaluate too closely um, like an AI generator or something. And then when I want to care about aesthetics, I'm a game developer in my spare time and then I don't worry about evaluating it because I don't have to write papers about those things. 
Um, so I'm basically a massive fraud. Um, I think um, I think at least pulling on my experience in computational creativity, like talking to people, is great. Um, but I think I think your best bet is to look at um, is to look at uh, HCI work and the way other people, the way people assess um, these kinds of things in other types of artifact. Um, there's also a couple of papers you might be interested in. So Gillian Smith has a paper about the aesthetics of procedural content generation, I believe. Um, a couple of papers, maybe even. And I think um, those are those are like really good uh, kind of breezy reads. Um, also, I think uh, you can look at things like how, how game developers assess whether um, games convey the right feel during playtesting. So if you look at something like uh, the MDA paper, uh, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. And then you think about, okay, if I was making a game about companionship and during playtesting, how would I make sure that this was being conveyed to people? Um, and I think you probably want to go down the, the same lines. But what I will say is, as you mentioned, it, you know, you, you might find it's hard to convince people of that anyway. So, so there are lots of people for whom these things are just too touchy feely. They, they just, don't, they, you know, they want things that can be just measured. This is a thing like Jillian. It's always winds Gillian Smith up uh, whenever anyone measures fun, like because it's preposterous in, on many levels. Um, you can do things like Georgia says about like relative stuff, like you know, did you enjoy this more? Um, but when you like write a function that gives you a number between zero and one, that was how fun this thing is. Um, you know, it, it's frustrating, and lots of people their instinct is to do that. Um, I didn't really answer your question at all, but I definitely uh, sympathize. Um, uh, regarding the smoothing stuff, hey Vanessa. One, why don't you let players control the metrics directly? Yes. Two, have you looked at exploratory landscape analysis? People not so sure. I think, um, I think, I think, you've, I, I think you might have asked me about exploratory landscape before and I said I would read about it and then I forgot about it because it sounded super relevant and interesting. And, and I definitely think from my memory of it, or someone has mentioned it to me before, um, yes, it, it, sounds, it sounds highly relevant. Um, but the first question, it's a little bit complicated because let's suppose you do adjust one of these metrics. Um, the problem is you don't know which parameter is best to achieve it, or there may be multiple ways to achieve a metric value. Um, so if you look at our CIG paper from 2016, one of the things that let the user do is say, I want, um, I want a generator with an average yield of, of this metric and this value. And then it would search the parameter space from, for generators that, um, that fulfilled that. But there were two funny things about that. One was that we couldn't give the player any, we couldn't give the user any control because the solution could be anywhere in the n-dimensional parameter space. So it was basically like we would just give them an answer. And the second problem that we could solve, it was like future work, but you know what future work is like, um, was that if there are multiple answers to that question, how do you show the player and how do you make them care about the difference? So for instance, you know, if you want um, a level that is very easy, one solution might be to have a nice balance of enemies and power-ups. Another solution is to have no enemies. And Dinesh would not distinguish those two because they both fulfill the thing you asked for. Um, so that's another interesting question of like, how do you say to players, okay, I can take you to these two parts of the parameter space, but one of them is probably better than the other. Um, and that's, like a, that's an open and interesting question. Uh, I'm really glad Dinesh is getting more work, but I feel like there's this big question of where, how you get the metrics. You're using that as a pretty unique skill. Absolutely. Any thoughts on how to do this? So the way I've always wanted to try doing it um, is, so, so the question here is, is like, and this is completely true, these metrics underpin everything in Dinesh in particular. Like every single feature it has requires you to know the properties of the content that you want, that you're interested in. And this is a problem for novice users, which Dinesh is like supposedly aimed to support. The, the solution I always wanted to use was um, to have people do this interactively, maybe using like um, a very small scale machine learning thing, uh, where they say, okay, I'm gonna define a property, you're gonna show me content, and I'm gonna tell you like, these ones are positive examples, these ones are negative, these ones are meh, and we're gonna try and together, we're gonna try and define what this thing is. And then maybe over time, Dinesh is like, okay, I think, I think these ones are, are here. And, um, and we've never done it, but it's something I would love to do. Um, the second kind of cheap, if I was doing this like on a budget and a time limit thing, is that um, 
it would be nice to kind of target common domains like levels, like dungeons, like um, items in an RPG, and give people like uh, common metrics that they might want to use in the same way that you might ship, uh, you know, a game engine with a set of physics engine settings or par or particle systems. Um, but the 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 long term goal is like, can we get people to define them interactively? Um, <laughs> I see that emoji, Matthew. Um, uh, one thing I'm taken to doing is to apply crossover from other media, yes, as a method of producing aesthetic experience. So applying computer vision to extract aesthetic qualities from films and applying that to dynamic game systems. That sounds really interesting. Um, that sounds like a, a fascinating project all on its own. And uh, I would love to see, like, you should totally send me um, some, like, if you've got any links, I could read more about that. That sounds really fun. Um, I think it aren't like there's like a way to satisfy like some parts of, of the thing you were talking about, but I think others, which is just this question of like, I, I've written long poetic things about desert golfing, uh, but it might just be that I'm reading way too into it. Uh, I met the designer at GDC um, and I got so overexcited, I think I completely freaked him out um, because I, I, it's, for most people it's like, it's an arcade golfing game. Like <laughs> You don't need to go overboard on it. Um, so there is this question of like, you know, evaluating how people respond to games is, is super hard. I, I like the idea of transference, um, but ultimately you never know what someone's going to take away from something, which is part of the fun of making like art, I guess. Uh, have you seen PCG applied to slash with physics? Um, do you mean... Uh, so, so do you mean sort of like procedurally generating the, the physical settings of a world, for instance? Um, one thing that I have observed while you're typing is that um, PCG works super well with physics systems. It's just like, that's why desert golfing is fun. It's why um, lots of games work because physics systems are like noise for interaction and PCG is like noise for, for level design. And they just like go together in this really satisfying way. Um, and that's why last night I was telling people why the number one feature I wanted in No Man's Sky was just to be able to play golf on the surface of any planet. Um, uh, generate game rules with physics. Yeah, that is, um, so that's, I think that is something which humans are very good at doing because humans innately understand the slapstick comedic nature of physics systems. And it's something which is, I've never tried to do it, but my, my instinct is that it will be hard because these systems are so continuous and unpredictable that I think um, AI would, would struggle more. They would struggle more to identify, because lots of physics systems work based on like feel. Like you look at Sub Rosa, which is, you know, it, it, if you put that in a, in a less goofy engine, it's a very boring game. It, the re, like the reason, one of the reasons why it's so funny is because these people are flailing all over the place because the physics system is so silly. And I think um, detecting things like visual comedy is something that's, that's still pretty hard for an AI. Um, but it is a really interesting idea, and I'd love to see it tried out. Yeah. All right, those were awesome questions. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks for listening. And uh, I'm sure I will talk to you all in the future on, on Twitter and things like that. Thank you. <laughs>